My name is Tice Winkleblack, an Iowa City Foreign Relations Council board member and t- today's program host. I was, the ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since the year that Vanessa Williams became the first African American Miss America in 1983. I'd also like to announce uh, with some excitement uh, that that thanks to all of your support, we have reached our spring fundraising campaign goal. So congratulations to all of you, and thank you. We're we're very excited to move into a a new phase for the ICFRC and our uh, friend organization, the Council on International Visitors to Iowa Cities, and feel confident that with uh, your continued support uh, and participation that we'll we'll have another wonderful 35 years and beyond. Um, I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the UI Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support, and also thank today's special uh, financial sponsors, the Norton Fund, Ellen Swanson of Blank and McCune Realtors, Midwest One Bank, and Allison Ken Atkinson. I also thank City Channel 4, again, um, for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2, and UI Libraries Digital Archives. Over 247 ICFRC podcasts can now be found on iTunes. And so I'd like to ask these interns to come forward. Megan Phillips, Alexander Hernandez Pardo, Jeffrey Clark, JJ Meyer, Alex Jaime, and Caitlin Chenu. If you could come up to the podium. Um, You know, uh, all of you make the ICFRC function. Uh, Your selfless and tireless service and advocacy is truly exceptional. And um, the fact that you're also high achieving students at the same time uh, is just, just truly remarkable. So thank you. And I'm happy to get to present to you. It's really happening. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, and you can take your coveted ICFRC mug out into the world with you, and congratulations on your graduation, so thanks. Uh, It's my pleasure to introduce Dan Kaplan and Kayla Earps for today's presentation. Dr. Dan Kaplan is department head of UI Preventative and Community Dentistry. Dan studies outcomes related to endodontic treatment, decision-making in endodontics, relationships between oral and systemic diseases, and evaluation of diagnostic tests. Dr. Kaplan has put together numerous global research programs for University of Iowa dental students and global health students, including the Pondicherry International Student Observership Program that Kayla and Dr. Kaplan will be speaking about today. Kayla Earps is a second year student at the University of Iowa College of Dentistry. She's passionate about community outreach, working with underprivileged populations, and traveling the world. In fact, I was asking about her travels, and she noted she had never been out of the country since uh, until 2015, and and I think she listed about uh, nine or 10 countries that she has traveled to since then. So we look forward to her continued travels and perhaps repeat presentations in the future. Um, With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Dan Kaplan, and thank you for presenting to us today. 
Um, thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks to everybody for coming today. I don't want to take too much time because the star of the show really today is Kayla. She's going to talk about her experiences last summer on a uh, dental observership program that was put together in combination between the, the UI College of Dentistry and the Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences in Pondicherry, India. But before I turn it over to Kayla, I'm going to just go through a few slides here that talks a little that talk a little bit about how this whole thing came to be. Uh, the impetus for global health, uh, global oral health research and education projects in particular for this and some and some other projects in particular came from uh, kind of a seed that was funding from a generous donor named uh, Dick and Nancy Christensen. Dick graduated from the University of Iowa College of Dentistry some years ago, and he wanted to give back uh, monetarily to the College of Dentistry and particular and in particular to help spur uh, the global name of the University of Iowa College of Dentistry. And so through the generous donation from him and his wife, uh, they created an endowed professorship, and I was asked by our dean, David Johnson, if I would be interested in leading the charge with the endowed professorship at the College of Dentistry, and I said, sure, I would be happy to do that. With this project in particular, though, uh, after he had appointed me that and the, the process went through, I had to come up with ideas, right? Well, what, what am I going to do with this <laughs> endowment? And so I put out a call to the College of Dentistry, the, the faculty, and I said, who, who wants to to help with ideas for funding. And one of the ideas that came up was from uh, Dr. Satish Kara. Unfortunately, Dr. Kara passed away last year, but he had been a lifelong faculty member at the College of Dentistry, and he had always wanted some kind of outreach to India, where he grew up. Well, as many of you know, or maybe all of you know, there's a very, uh, there's a very extensive program that is here mostly for uh, pre-doctoral, but also some doctoral programs uh, called UI Winterum that sends students to India, various places in India, every single year. And it's been going at, oh, for over 10 years, 12 years, something strong, and under the direction of Dr. Raja Gopal, or Raj, as we call him. And I had wanted dentistry to become part of that. Okay, so I called him over because, because other colleges in the university all participate in that, and dentistry was not one of them, and I didn't understand why that was. So I said, I want to be part of that. And ultimately, the timing didn't work out for our College of Dentistry to be involved. We have a very structured system over there at the College of Dentistry that just couldn't go when the rest of the university went. But we wanted to go anyway. And I put together a group. Uh, I went with Dr. Kara and a couple of other faculty members, Dr. Alleretti from our orthodontics department and Dr. Mike Morell from Family Dentistry. Mike, uh, Dr. Alleretti's from uh, India and Mike is not from India, but he's been to India. That was his 10th trip when he came with us. So we went to Southern India there. We went to three places in Southern India and I'm gonna talk about the one where we were, which is Pondicherry, but, uh, but first, with all the news about flooding in the area here, I thought I would let you know, we arrived, our plane touched down in Chennai uh, in southern India about three weeks after they had experienced just horrible flooding from a uh, hurricane, and there, was, there wasn't water so much there in the streets of Chennai. When we were there, it had all dissipated by then, but there was plenty of evidence that there had been a disaster there, and, and so... Uh, I just thought I would show you some of the photos there, and, uh, and that's where, where we were. Uh, coming up this summer, uh, summer of 2019, is going to be the fourth trip that we're going to be making. So it started out with me and three faculty colleagues going to India, and then the next year we were able to uh, send four dental students, uh, and D4 means fourth year dental students, so they're in the last year of their dental program plus one graduate student and one emeritus faculty went on the trip. Then in summer of 2018, Kayla went. She is a second year dental student uh, now, just finishing her second year. And also there was a MPH student, master's in public health student named Monica. And Monica unfortunately was unable to be here today. She is a dentist who got her dental training in India. 
So she wanted to go back and she did the observership program with Kayla. And then this, this year, in about a month, we're gonna be sending four first year dental students, one second year student and one adjunct faculty member. So gearing up for that and excited about it. Kayla will tell you more about this, but basically there were two main entities in Pondicherry that we are interfacing with. One is the Indira, Indira Gandhi Institute for Dental Sciences, and they have a, a Department of Public Health Dentistry there that goes out into the, the fields and into the towns, and I, I won't say anything more about that because Kayla will talk quite a bit about that. On the left, you see a, a mobile dental van, so there are dental chairs inside the van that they have there. Uh, and that's their slogan on the right there, public health dentistry right to your door. And then uh, the other organization, and again, Kayla will talk about this, is a uh, school that is set up for uh, kids with special needs and their families. And uh, Kayla will have some photos again, so she'll elaborate more on that. The picture in the lower right was just a picture I put in. We said, can you take a picture of us here in front of the school? And, Somebody said sure, and then a cow walked right in front of us. And that's part of the life there, so I like the photo. So thank you very much. At this point, I'll just turn it over to Kayla, and she will take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you about this today. So basically, I'm just going to tell you kind of my story of um, what I experienced last summer in India. So when we, when we arrived, um, we flew into Chennai, which is the city that Dr. Kaplan showed you pictures of the flooding. Um, and then we had like about a three hour drive to the southeast coast of India um, to a city called Pondicherry. Um, the first day we got to kind of rest and experience, go and tour, tour the city. And these are some of my favorite photos that I had from Pondicherry. Um, there's a Gandhi statue up in the upper left. Um, and then it's right on the beach, which is beautiful. So there's some, someone catching some waves there. Um, a lot of these fishing boats on the beach that were very colorful and vibrant. And then just another uh, mural on the wall with some flowers. I thought it was very unique and really neat graffiti there. So Pondicherry, like I said, is in the southeast part of India. And it's just that little red dot there on the map. Um, the city has a lot of French influence. So if you can see in the background, a lot of the architecture had these nice pastel colors. Um, you could just definitely tell uh, that the European architecture influence was there. Um, Pondi is it's also referred to as Pondi. Um, Pondi is a touristy area, so every summer a lot of Europeans come there and they actually have like summer homes there, kind of like a lot of people from Iowa go to the Ozarks or something like that. So that was also really cool. <clears throat> and as he mentioned earlier, uh, we partnered with Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences. Um, we have a really strong relationship with the school there. We're going on our, our next, gearing up for the next trip this upcoming summer. Um, they have amazing faculty and mentors. And what I thought was really neat is that before we even went, the faculty in charge of the, de the public health dental department, they reached out to Monica and I and said, what would you really like to get out of this? We want to cater this trip to you. You know, we're going to be doing public health anyway, but do you want to see people in nursing homes? Do you want to go to the prisons? Do you want to go to special needs schools, orphanages? So it was really neat that we got to choose. Um, they also did a really great job of treating us like family. So the picture on the upper right, the three, the three men to my left are the faculty at the dental school that are in public health. Um, Dr. Sentil is the main one in the middle who organized everything. And then the woman directly beside me is Ms. Chitra Shah, and she is the one who started the special needs schools in India, um, which I'll allude to a little bit later. I'll, I'll mention a little bit later. And then Monica, the master's of public health student, is right next to Chitra. And then these are just some pictures um, this upper left one is myself with a group of dental students there. Um, it was really interesting that like 98% of them or something like that were female. Um, here it's about a 50-50 split between male and female, but in India it's a lot more female dominant in dentistry, which is really interesting. And then it might be a little hard to see, but the bottom left is like our typical group picture for the day. So about 30 to 40 people went on these outreaches. So the first day at the school, we had an orientation. Um, we met the vice chancellor and the dean of the school, and they greeted us with um, nice gifts. We got to tour their entire department. Um, they actually have all of the dental specialties that Iowa has, which is really unique and really interesting that I got to see 
the differences in curriculum and the similarities, um, which is very eye-opening. What I thought was really neat is that the students in their final year, they make what's called an aid, which is like an educational piece that they then um, turn over and donate to one of the communities that they're doing outreach. Um, so this one, they took a spin on the game Monopoly. It's called Odentopoly. So it's like dental questions and you know advice about brushing your teeth and stuff. Um, up in the top right, you can see like <clears throat> they have like a giant pack of cigarettes. It's about smoking cessation. And each cigarette was about this big and you could unroll it and it became a poster with information about why smoking is bad and everything, which I thought was really, I mean, they're very creative projects. Um, a, also, a couple of the items were patented, which is really cool. Um, it might not look like much, but the little green chair, um, I don't think the mouse works, that's why I'm using my fingers, sorry, but the little green chair in the upper right, it's like a foam chair that the headrest just goes back and you can put it on a folding chair like this and that actually saves the providers and the patients for dental outreach. They have something to rest their head on and it kind of helps your posture and everything. So that something that seems so simple was made a huge difference in these outreach. Um, they were also super proud to have us there. They had giant posters across the entire campus. The whole health college knew that we were coming. <clears throat> Um, these are some of the things that <clears throat> I thought were most eye-opening. There were um, a lot of street dogs everywhere um, that were something you don't typically see around here. <clears throat> um, this is a picture of like the typical traffic in the city like during our commutes to and from the school. Um, it's a little bit crazier than here in Iowa City as you can see. The, we would typically ride around in what's called a tuk-tuk. <clears throat> It's like an open three-wheeled vehicle um, pictured here on the bottom. Um, you, it's not atypical to see like cat, cattle walking in the streets or street, do street dogs. And um, this bottom picture is a picture of a public toilet. Uh, so what you see here, I'll, I'll tell you the parts that, that I recognize here. When, when I went on my trip with the other faculty members, <clears throat> excuse me, no, <laughs> it's not, not the same thing gonna happen. Uh, when, when I went with the other faculty members, we mostly stayed at the dental school, and we went out to one site where they might do outreach about 10 miles away or so. So Kayla's trip is quite a bit different. They spent most of their time outside, of, outside the dental school in villages and in fields going around. And in the lower left there, you can see Kayla with Dr. Sentil. They have, uh, um, that was one of the first things we had when I went to just lop the top off a coconut and put a straw in it, and you're just drinking coconut milk right there. And then you can see uh, some of the types of places that Kayla went to with the dental team. And I would say they, they had uh, faculty members there from the dental college, but also students there at the dental college going through with Kayla and with Monica as well. So this is just some of the sites, the type of places that they went. Uh, food, right? Food is one of the big pieces of any culture that you go to. Uh, food also, though, is important with respect to diet and nutrition and some oral health issues as well. So it's not just a cultural thing. Uh, there, I thought there was a lot of variety there. If you are a vegetarian, India, southern India, where we were, is a great place to be. They have vegetarian restaurants all over the place. Uh, southern India, where we were, is, is known to have very spicy food as well. So some people have had or could have problems with that. I, I didn't have any problems with it. I thought it was great. Uh, but this is, uh, and that's uh, some food on a banana leaf. And one, one thing that Kayla said was that many, many times when they were out in the field, f families would prepare from there, even if they didn't have much at all to offer. They, would, they were very proud of what they made, and they would offer Kayla and Monica food and, and the other students too as well. So now uh, on to the dental outreach camps. You ready? You can try and come back in. I think it's better. It's kicking in now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back a couple to this one. This picture up here is a, like the types of homes we saw on the outreach that we went to. Um, <clears throat> made out of like twigs and um, tin roofs and everything. Um, we also got to participate in a health um, prayer, prayer rituals. And <clears throat> this middle picture is a picture of us feeding cattle, which are very sacred animals in India. <clears throat> um, the other picture here is a group of women gathered in a field, and they're actually the primar primarily the 
manual laborers there. So they are bending over backwards, picking um, rice paddy, planting, um, harvesting and everything. And we actually had them grouped there for a tobacco cessation meeting, um, which was very interesting to see that the women there are the ones that are primarily doing the farming. <clears throat> Um, and before we talk about the dental outreach, um, this is kind of like the main reason why I went over there. Um, but I do want to inform you that we did include some cases and some photos that may appeal a little bit unappetizing to you guys. Um, just wanted to give you a fair warning. Dr. Kaplan and I thought that they were really um, important to include because it was an integral part of my experience there. Um, and it also shows the vast differences between India and the U.S. <clears throat> So the first camp we went to was to a small village. And on the way, I kind of talked about how we got blessings from the God of health. Um, it was really nice that they included us in their, their rituals. And, you know, I felt they were very welcoming to us. <clears throat> the first day we treated 180 patients. And we we're usually only at each camp for like about six hours or so. Um, my reflections are that it was my first day of like truly acclimating to the heat. Uh, we are out like usually either in the sun or something just covered by shade, but it was super hot. It was about 100 degrees every day <clears throat> with 80% humidity. When you're wearing like a, a white doctor coat over long sleeves and pants, it gets to be really dehydrating. Um, so those coconuts were life changing. <laughs> like honestly, they brought me, I almost passed out the first day and it brought me right back up, which was awesome. I was also impressed by the the efficient organization and the teamwork. You know, it was my first time ever experiencing something like this and seeing how they can bring all the gear in their mobile van and set it up in like a dirt path or in like an empty classroom and turn it into a dental office was so cool. I'd never seen something like that before. Um, I was also impressed by the patient flow. <clears throat> um, not everyone in India has a cell phone, so everything had to be um, everything was marketed by word of mouth. So it was kind of slow in the morning and actually it picked up in the afternoon because people would go and say, hey, you need to go see these people. Like they're doing amazing things for us. And so um, it was a really nice <clears throat> demonstration of how powerful the word of mouth is. <clears throat> um, in, this in this village, it was their first time seeing a dentist or the first time the school had gone out there to do outreach. And the disease burden was actually really high because of that. Um, so we got we got to treat a lot of people and, you know, see, um, explain to them the importance of toothbrushing and things like that, which I thought was really important. These are just some pictures of an empty classroom turned into a dental office. And here's some photos of some of the work that was being done. Um, one of the crazy things to me is that all the, the only procedure that they gave people anesthesia for were extractions. So that means like getting their tooth, like fillings done and stuff like that. They didn't use dental anesthesia. Um, which I thought was really brave, but they just sat there and tolerated it, which was really cool to see. Um, these are some uh, cases. Um, the first one is really sad. The kid was about three years old, and he just didn't, he, it's what something we call early childhood caries, severe early childhood caries. Basically, his teeth are just rotten and broken down to the gum line, um, which is really sad, and it wasn't uncommon to see that there. Um, the other ones are kind of something like anomalies, something that you don't really see very often here, which I thought were really cool. You know, I was a, at the time I was a first year dental student. And these things were just awesome to me. So just some differences in anatomy there. Um, that one over there is like retained baby teeth. And this one's just got an extra cusp on it in the front. Um, and then the second day we went and did a door-to-door -door oral cancer screening, um, which was a really eye-opening experience. Um, basically, we went and knocked on people's homes. Um, you can see they have like hay roofs or like I showed earlier, like a tin roof or something. We just knock on their door. Um, usually the females were gone working in the fields, but um, we'd open it up and ask for permission to take a look. And basically we're just screening for precancerous or cancerous lesions. Um, this day we saw 180 patients and <clears throat> kind of the hardest thing to see was that about nine out of 10 people had a precancerous or cancerous lesion because of the present the prevalence of tobacco use in India. It's something called beetle quid. Um, basically, they pouch it, and it's something that gives them energy. It suppresses their appetite, and the reason they use it is kind of to get through the full workday without taking any breaks, which is kind of heartbreaking. You know, we did a lot of 
counseling to quit and they weren't really receptive to it because to them, like that's kind of a mode of survival. Um, but we did, we would get them, um, referrals to come to the school so that they could get a free cleaning and then a biopsy and get something taken care of if they had, if it was a bad lesion. Um, the picture on the upper left, I really love that. This is like one of the first homes we went into and they invited us in and they were so happy. It was like a, a mother and a father and a son. And this is like their living room. You can see they're sitting on the couch. Um, and then at the end, they sent us away with a bag of peanuts, which was awesome because that's something they probably had to work really hard for, but they were so thankful that we came and they were sending us with a, a thank you gift. These are some pictures of the precancerous or cancerous lesions that we saw. And as you can see, they're just, there's a lot of staining on the teeth from the tobacco use. Um, and for me, I'd never seen something like this. So it was, I hadn't even taken my oral pathology class yet. And so I really didn't know what was going on. Um, here's some other pictures there. So some of the spots we see. And it was really neat because this year I finally took my oral pathology class and I, I recognized a lot of these things. And I said, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of those in person. But, you know, it was a great learning opportunity. Um, in this community, they also had the government funded daycare. Um, basically, the parents, if they were working, they would drop their kids off during the day. Um, they make sure that they're fed nutritious meals, given vitamins, and they also make sure that they're vaccinated. Um, so this is just a picture of some of the kids there. Um, this is the my favorite day at the camps. Um, it's at Satya Special School, which was funded by Chitra Shah, who we talked about earlier. Um, at the school here, we treated 80 patients. Uh, we did a lot of interactive instruction for oral hygiene. We had like teeth mannequins with large toothbrushes to make sure they could participate and understand what we were talking about. Um, something I was so impressed by was how cooperative and tolerant these patients were. Like I said, they only use anesthetic for tooth extractions. Um, and so I just anticipated these children with special needs kind of um, not being receptive to that. But they sat there and sat there and they did so well. And it, it just was such a vast difference from some of the kiddos that we see here. <laughs> um, the staff there was so encouraging and they were super helpful for the student providers, you know, Keep in mind some of the students doing the dental stuff, the dental work, this is kind of a new experience for them as well, so they might be a little nervous, but everyone was so supportive and it was just an awesome environment to be in. It was also very organized and um, afterwards Monica and I got to tour one of, or a couple of Chitra's schools. Um, now I'll talk about her schools a little bit. So Chitra Shah, she basically turned nothing into something, something really big. So. In India, um, a lot of children with intellectual disabilities are ostracized from society. A lot of them are don't make it into adulthood just because of that. Um, so she saw a need there, and what she did was built up a school. Um, she started with just a couple kids, just so that the parents, uh, so that they could be watched during the day while the parents worked. Basically, one school over the years, she just kept working and working, and she now has nine schools and helps over 900 children with disabilities in Pondicherry, India. So everyone there knows her. She's just done so much for their city, and it's, it was really heartwarming for me to see something like that because this is the population that I hope to work with someday, so I was really inspired by her. And these are some pictures of the students there. They were so excited to have us. <clears throat> I was really impressed with her curriculum at the schools. Um, it's a little more basic than here, you know, they're not using iPads like a lot of kids are now, but they use like tree nutshells and chalk and everything and they got the same point across. They learned the same lessons and it was just really creative to see the ways they were doing these. Um, one of my favorite schools that we visited was her trade school. So children after over the age of 18, they would go to this school and learn a trade. Um, this man here is make, weaving rugs for sale. Um, they made piggy banks, they made jewelry, they made cookies, they um, pressed paper cups together. Basically, they learned all these tricks and trades and they would sell their items in the market. Um, and then once they graduated from trade school, they could get a job in, in the public, which makes them a really valued member of society. And the day after this, we went to a public um, special needs school. So this one's government run. It w and Chitra's schools are all private funded. Um, so there were some differences that I noticed. Um, one of the main ones was that 
at the, uh, in Asian culture, it's very common to take your shoes off at the door. Um, but a lot of times when we were doing dentistry, they just kind of bypassed that and overlooked that. But however, at this school, they required everyone to take them off, including the dental providers. Um, so we were walking around doing barefoot dentistry, which was the first time I've ever done something like that. And um, I don't know if that would fly very well over here, but it was really interesting to be a part of. Um, the, the patients here were also super tolerant, but this is the one school I did see a few behavioral episodes at. Um, and the, the faculty there were a lot more strict, and um, I could just really tell that they, they had a certain regimen that they wanted to keep to and not really stray afar from. And this day we also saw 80 patients, and we did the same thing with the interactive learning about oral hygiene. And here's some pictures of this one. Um, in the middle, that little boy is actually one of the students, and he told us that he wanted to be a dentist someday, so it was really cute that he was helping out one of the Indian dental students work on his classmate. And then we also went to a transgender society. Um, so again, the transgender population in India is kind of ostracized from society. They um, have this special meeting place where they it's safe for them to go and it's a supportive community. So that was one of the places we went. This day we had um, a lower patient population. We only had 45 people come through that day. But it was kind of nice because that allowed us to provide more for them. So do a cleaning and maybe whatever cavities they had to get filled or teeth pulled. So we got to do more than just one thing on their list, um, which allowed for comprehensive care in a way. Um, it was a really tight, like really tight quarter. So we had to like utilize hallways to do some screenings and stuff, which was just interesting. Um, the main thing I learned is that it doesn't take much space at all to get the job done, which is really cool. And here are some pictures from that. Um, this student here was doing a research project on gum health, and so she's explaining the importance of taking care of your gums as well as your teeth. And then the very last camp we went to was um, a non-traditional orphanage. And this day we saw 120 patients. Um, <clears throat> before before we started seeing them, Dr. Sentil gathered them all, like kind of you are right here, and explained like brushing your teeth with the models and everything, and it was really interactive. He was making them laugh. Um, this population actually spoke a lot of English. Um, the The orphanage is European influenced, and basically they live in um, homes with a mother, a volunteer mother, and then about ten. 10 kids per home, and they kind of run as a family. Um, so it's not, and then they have main gathering spaces, community spaces and stuff like that. But within those homes, the families can choose which religion they want to participate, which masses they want to go to, which um, rituals they want to participate in. They plan their meals as a family. So the 10 of them are just kind of a tight unit. And then they're also allowed to collaborate with the other neighboring homes, which is a really unique style of orphanage. Um, but with that, a lot of them did speak English, which was kind of fun to talk with them. Um, the oral hygiene instruction proved successful because when they came through the clinics, we would say, like, how many times do you brush your teeth? And they knew the answer. They were so excited to tell us that they were paying attention during the lecture. And then we got to tour the homes afterwards, which was really awesome. Here's some pictures from the orphanage. The one in the middle is the beginning when he's explaining the dental care to them. And then there's some of the kids there with us. And then on the last day, um, basically Monica and I put together a presentation and presented it to the dean, the vice chancellor, and everybody that participated during the week. Um, they kind of wanted to see our views on the program because this is part of their curriculum. And so they wanted to see what, what it was like coming from an outsider. And here they are presenting us our portfolio, our plaques after we presented our portfolios. And so in the free, we did have some free time. Um, we usually had one day on each weekend to explore. And so this is the, some, of things, some of the things I did. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Life of Pi, but part of it was filmed in Pondicherry. Um, this exact scene, um, these trees are called banyan trees. They, they grow up and then the roots, they have like aerial roots that grow, 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 grow and keep growing until they hit the soil and then they re-implant. So basically this main tree is all connected. It's just one big tree. 
Um, something that's really interesting from a dental aspect is that those roots can be ground up and used for natural toothpaste and dental products. So I thought that was really cool. Um, I also got to meet like famous local artists that have their work displayed in museums all over the world. And he teach was teaching me there um, how to throw clay on the wheel. So that was kind of fun. I got to get my hands messy. Um, and there's some of his beautiful work there. I also got to go to a community called Oroville. And Oroville, the vision is to find human unity within diversity. It's super unique. Um, there's people from 49 nations, uh, all social classes. It's self-sustaining, so basically everything that's sold, it is kind of touristy part of it is, but everything that's sold there is grown and produced there, um, which is awesome. Their products are really great, organic. Um, we got to take a few home with us, which was really neat. In the middle, they have what's called a matrimandir. It's a zone of peace, somewhere where they can go and meditate and pray, and um, it's the gold one in the middle there. And then if you look from the aerial view, it kind of has this galaxy-like look, which is really neat. So it's just a very unique place. I've never, there's nothing like it else in the, anywhere else in the world. So these are some of my take home messages, some of the things that I thought um, I really wanted to hammer home when I gave this presentation to the, my uh, fellow dental students, something that may inspire them to come. Um, how tolerant and cooperative the patients were, especially with only getting uh, numb for tooth extractions. It's just, I think we take getting numb uh, for granted here sometimes because I don't know how those people sat there through that, but that was amazing. Um, how, how it was really neat to see the differences technology and materials that they use and different techniques. You know, everything's very similar, but it's also very different. Um, a little more basic there, um, but it shows that you can get the same end result no matter what you're using. Um, the focus on curative dentistry versus preventative. So here it's really common to go to the dentist like every six months or so and get a cleaning and get your fluoride varnish and our water has fluoride in it. Um, we have sealant programs to protect the teeth. It's very, a lot of focus on preventative dentistry here that isn't over there. Basically, when the only time people go to the dentist there is when something really hurts, um, and it's probably too far gone to be saved. <clears throat> so I talked to Dr. Sentil about this, and he wants to try and focus on preventative, but there's, there's too much of a disease load right now to control before working on preventative, and he actually has to you know, talk with the government a lot and make a lot of arrangements for something like this to happen, but he hopes that it will in the future. Um, this word on learning is something that Dr. Sentil really wanted Monica and I to focus on. Basically, he wanted us to take any preconceived notions about India and s explain what we saw in India that made us unlearn that. And the main thing was for me that you can offer so much more at a dental camp than just preventative services. All the volunteering I've done here locally has been doing like a screening um, and a referral to our school and then maybe putting some fluoride varnish on. But right there, they kind of just saw the need and took care of it that day, which was really cool. Um, I was also really impressed with how quickly they set up the units. They put all the supplies in the back of that van. Within 30 minutes, it's turned into a dental office, which was awesome. Um, and then any of the treatment that couldn't be done that day, um, if it was like a root canal or a biopsy or something more intense, um, they gave a free a certificate to get it done for free at their college. Um, the students had a lot of autonomy and freedom in clinical decision making. Basically, the faculty just kind of floated and came over if needed. Um, but that was really awesome to witness that. They had a really positive relationship. You know, They conversed a lot about cases and it was kind of student driven, making them feel like they were the, the main providers there. The language barrier was a little bit tricky for me. Um, the place I excelled the most at was the orphanage where they spoke English and then some of the special needs homes, they use sign language, which I understand a little bit of. Um, so other than that, I kind of had to um, use the students there to translate and kind of explain what they're telling their patients and everything. I did learn a couple um, words in Tamil, which is the, the native language there, but not enough to <laughs> keep the conversation going. Um, I was really impressed by the flexibility of the program, how they catered to our interest. I wanted to see special needs schools, and we got to go to two of them. And Monica had an interest in oral cancer and like young kids. Um, we saw a lot of kids while we were there and then the oral cancer screening. So they basically said, what do you want to do? And they made it happen. 
it was amazing that in just five days, the, st the students and the team of about 30, 30, 40 people, um, they served 685 patients. Um, to put this in perspective, um, one of the big outreaches that we do here in Iowa is called Iowa Mission to Mercy. It's one weekend a year. Um, it's about two and a half days, Thursday afternoon, all day Friday and all day Saturday. I would say there are at least 200 to 300 volunteers. A lot of the dental students go and then dentists from around Iowa. Basically, it's a weekend of free dentistry. Um, this past year in September, we saw 793 patients. So just comparing those two numbers about what how what, what a small team can do by doing it every day was just really awesome. Um, it's awesome that they got to serve that many people. They're really focused on taking care of their public there. Um, the lifestyle versus happiness and outlook on life. This is probably the main thing I, when I, when I think of India and people ask me about it, this is the main thing that I think of. Um, these people don't usually have much. The people we're working with, they have little to nothing, but they are literally some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life. They, you go into their house made of sticks with a tin roof and they greet you with a smile and a hug and they're so thankful for what you're providing for them and you know they send you with, away with gifts. Um, they're really thankful for what they have. They don't take things for granted. There's a big focus on family. And like I said, it's just amazing to see how people can live so simple but be some of the happiest people I've ever met. It's very um, humbling and inspiring to kind of change the way your outlook on life. And I think it's really important, especially as healthcare professionals, to be able to work with people with diverse values and beliefs and behaviors. You know, it's 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 really important to be culturally culturally aware, um, take into take take certain circumstances into consideration. You know, whether it's a religious belief or a certain practice or anything. Um, I think it makes you a more well-rounded provider. And these are just some pictures of my lifelong friends that I met while I was there. We still keep in touch to this day. An awesome group of dental students and faculty there. And I think this is my last slide. So I thank you for your attention. I apologize for the coughing spell and the technical difficulties, but we'll open this to any questions that you guys may have. If only I had my glasses on. I'm going to start with the biggest, the biggest font here. Uh, did you notice any suggestion of... Um, I think using Ayurvedic medicine, I think. using Ayurvedic, uh, Ayurveda natural medicine. Um, not so much at the dental school particularly, but when I went on that private tour, um, when they explained how they use, they grind up the roots to use for their natural toothpaste, you know, I got hints of it there. Um, but in India in general, there is a larger focus on Ayurvedic medicine. Um, but we were at the, the Health Sciences Institute, so it wasn't enforced as much there. Great. And then this questioner wants to know uh, whether or not you are aware of what the return rate, if people got f the certificate to come back for free dental care, did they take advantage of it? Is there a high percentage of people who use it, or is, do you, or maybe you don't know? Yeah, I actually did inquire about this to Dr. Sentil. Um, they really wanted their patients to come, and they noticed the first year they started doing outreach that they didn't have as many returning to the school with the certificates um, because transportation and getting there was an issue. We kind of went to remote places that were either 30 minutes to an hour away. Um, so for them to come to the school was really difficult. Um, so what they started doing was... Um, every once in a while, they'd provide a public transportation to get to the school, and they'd kind of arrange it so they were all done in the same day. That increased the numbers of follow-up and um, the care getting actually completed, which is great. Um, and just as a follow-up about your comment about uh, dental anesthesia, uh, did uh, patients who were getting root canals get it, we hope? So we didn't do any root canals. Um, the students didn't do root canals at the camps that we went to. Um, that was one of the instances where they would make the referral to the school. And at the school, they did use anesthesia for root canals. Um, I don't know if any of you are interested, but I asked why they don't use anesthetic. And there's a d couple different things that factor in. Um, one of them being the cost. It's just a saved cost there. Um, but another one is that <clears throat> basically if there's different layers to the tooth, and the deeper the cavity is, the more chance it either needs a more extensive treatment like a root canal or maybe to be extracted. So they kind of could gauge 
the depth of the cavity based on their, if they're starting to flinch, they're like, maybe we shouldn't go any deeper. Maybe they need to get the root canal. <laughs> that was the explanation they had for me, which I thought was interesting. You know, here we take a lot of x-rays and get the whole picture, but out in the camps, you couldn't do that. We didn't have x-ray technology, so they just went by visualization and feel and patient's reaction. So that was really interesting to see. It can be done. I, d I don't want to ever have that happen, but it can be done. I was going to say interesting slash terrifying. Um, do you know uh, when you're doing the pre-screenings for oral cancer um, or, uh, um, or pre-cancer, uh, whether or not patients were then able to receive treatment. Is that treatment of widely available? Is it um, affordable? Um, I only know a little bit about this, but the, the patients that had the cancerous lesions, they didn't want to take care of it. They just wanted to like let themselves just live their life and just take like deal with it, which is really sad. So what the students had to market it as was, come to our school, get a free cleaning, like we'll take care of you there. And at that point they could address the cancer because if they, they just, they weren't afraid of it because it was something that I think was bound to happen with their tobacco use. Um, so I'm not really sure on the cancer treatment options, but I know like the school is very, very reduced cost, um, if not free. And so they could at least get it biopsied and figure out if it was something that was going to, you know, progress really fast or not. Um, but as far as like chemo and radiation, I'm not really sure on what would happen from that. It's just a very high prevalence, which is hard to see. Um, I'd like to end with a question for each of you, um, but kind of the same question, which is how do you view um, this type of program assisting, and you touched a little bit upon this, Kayla, but assisting in your career and, you know, what do you think, uh, Dr. Kaplan, that students, you know, gain from, from doing a trip like this? Um, I think it's kind of the whole package. I mean, you get to see a lot of things that you might, might only see in textbooks. Um, you get to see that in person. You get to see how dentistry is carried out in a different way. You get to help so many people in such a little amount of time. Um, those numbers about our main mission here and what they do on a daily, ba a regular basis, they are very similar, um, which I think was really awesome. You get to reach out to some of the poorest of the poor. You take a lot more home with you than you pr bring there with you. You know, the memories and the humbleness and the, the attitude, the outlook on life. Um, I really think it's important to be able to work with people from everywhere in the world. You know, I, d I wish that more of my classmates would, could have gone with me last year, but I gave this speech and inspired at least five of them to go this upcoming summer. So I'm super excited that they're going to be able to experience this themselves and hopefully they come back with um, some new knowledge and we'll be able to converse that way. But this definitely isn't my last, wasn't my last international dental trip, you know. And I would just add to what Kayla said. I agree with everything she said, but I think there's one other big advantage of students going out on a trip like this, or even after the people are done being students and you're out in practice, it's that it helps you appreciate people from other, con other cultures who come here from other countries, and you are here in your office in rural Iowa or whatever, you're gonna be seeing people from all over the world, and I think it helps you appreciate what they came, where they came from and what they've been through. I was thinking just about the, uh, the fact that here we wear, we wear uh, shoes, socks and shoes on our feet. And the, well, if, imagine if every dentist you've ever gone to before has been barefoot, because you think that's more clean than wearing shoes that we walk around, you know, who knows what's on the bottom of our shoes, right? And you know, for somebody who thinks that, to come into a place where we are, they're gonna think everything is different. So I think going to places that are not what you're used to uh, is very beneficial for you once you get back home, it helps you take care of patients better here as well as there. Well, thank you both so much. Um, 
I really appreciate your perspective and glad that you had the experience and, and appreciate you sharing it with us today. I also would like to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the UI uh, Honors Program, UI Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support, and today's special sponsors, the Norton Fund, Alan Swanson of Blank and McCune Realtors, Midwest One Bank, and Allison Ken Atkinson, and a big thank you to City Channel 4, who carried the day today, uh, and for making our programs available to audiences um, all over. Uh, so Dan and Kayla, uh, you got a sneak preview of, you know, the big prize that you win for taking the time <laughs> to speak to us today, our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with all of that, I'd like to wish uh, the rest of you a good afternoon, and we hope to see you at our next programs in July. Bye-bye. <laughs>